I'm Don Black and I welcome you to The Calling. Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 14, that many are called, but few are chosen. What's the difference between hearing and obeying? Paul Wilbur is here with us today to discuss just that. For nearly 40 years, Paul has been using his gifts and talents as a musician to minister to people all around the world through anointed praise and worship. Brother, I'm so glad that you're here with us. Thank you, Don. It's what a blessing it is. Thank you for me too. To have you part of this program and part of this ministry. I know our family knows your music. I've been listening to you play for a long time. A long time. Well, this program is a part of the passion of our ministry as well. So it's a delight to join you. You know, I want to start with where you started. Tell us how you grew up. Mm. A little bit about your family life. Uh, I come from uh, one of those mixed homes. Uh, a Jewish dad, a non-Jewish mom. So uh, in the early years, mom would take us to uh, an assortment of different churches. Um, by the time I got to college, I chose uh, the temple. I joined uh, a synagogue downtown Cleveland. Actually, it turns out it was the same temple, Reformed temple, that Barry Siegel went to. If you've had Barry and Bacha Siegel here on your program from Israel, uh, Marty Getz, who's a good friend of mine, he went to temple right around the corner from me. So the Cleveland years were my uh, temple years. And music was always a part of our lives. My dad was a very gifted violinist. Um, grew up in a Jewish home, traditional Jewish home, so that what your father did, that's what you did. He wanted to be a violinist, he wanted to be a musician, but in a Jewish home, your father was a chemist, you'll be a chemist, your son will be a chemist. He hated chemistry. He, felt, he flunked out of chemistry twice in, his, in high school, barely made it into college, uh, where he met Ed McMahon, believe it or not. Ed McMahon? Ed McMahon from The Tonight Show way back. Um, but music was always in our home. And my dad uh, picked up his violin handed me a Sears and Roebuck guitar. Sears and Roebuck, this was before they were just Sears. <laughs> and, uh, and bought me a $10 guitar. And with his violin, we, we kind of found out what a C scale looked like on a guitar. And then he got me a teacher. We went on from there. I went to music school. Um, I wanted to be a cantor and an opera singer. A cantor and an opera singer. Yes, which was very, you know, back in, in those days, 18 whatever when I grew up, <laughs> um, there were two Jewish opera singers, um, Richard Tucker and Robert Merrill, who had become for me role models for my life. Jewish guys who had made it to the top of their field, and but they also used uh, some of their gifting for the synagogue. You could find them in the top, uh, synagogues of the world singing, special services, Passover, High Holidays, Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I said, that's what I'm going to do. Now, is that, Paul, is that what you wanted to do or is that what you thought your dad wanted you to do? No, actually, it's what I really wanted to do. Um, my dad, <laughs> my, my dad would tell me uh, musician jokes all the time, you know, like, what's the difference between a musician and a large pizza? Uh, you can feed a family of four with a large pizza. You know, I mean, it's... When I went into music school, wanting to be a singer, um, the, the dean of the school, a very well-known music school in Cleveland, Ohio, he told us less than 1% of you who graduate from here four years of music will actually wind up doing what you've come here to study. So we knew right from the start that this is a, uh, a needle in a haystack kind of a thing. And, um, but I pursued it. I was convinced this was what I was supposed to do. Something inside of me just drove me. I left college after graduating, moved to Italy, packed up a bag, moved to Milan, Italy, knew no Italian, knew no one there, jumped off the boat, you know, like Italians are, are always said of coming here, jumped off the boat and landed, and, and that's what I did in reverse. Wow, wow. What I like to do in this program is kind of hop around a little bit. I want to hop into a new space with you, into relaxing. Mm -hmm. So I know you travel all around the world. You know, you've got a lot of busyness in your life. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite way to relax? Um, 
before I changed into this shirt, <laughs> yeah. I had one that said Harley Davidson uh -huh. on the front, on the back. My socks say Harley Davidson. So I have uh, one in my garage. Yeah. It's, it's my, um, I call it my therapy. So you like to go on long rides or short mm -hmm. rides? Whatever my wife can tolerate. So she goes with you? Oh yeah, she's my riding buddy. Does she have your own or does she ride with you? No, because her legs are only about that long. So <laughs> she's five feet tall and uh, she's really intrigued by it. She, she told me early on, we, we're not motorcycle people. And uh, I waited until the opportune moment. I had just come back from three weeks gone in the Philippines, all over the Philippines. And I, I came in the house, it was early in the morning after flying all night, I said, I think I want to go see, look at motorcycles. She said, no, 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 you don't. You, you want to have breakfast with me. You want to relax in the house. I said, well, I really want to go look. She's all right, all right. She got up. We went to the cycle shop. I found a big, heavy touring bike and just took her around the parking lot. And she said, huh, that wasn't so bad. And now I have the gift of interpretation. <laughs> So I understood her to say in another language, we need one of these. Now. Now. I bought one. Now she's a Harley chick. and we, she really? She loves it. Well, that's a great thing for you guys to do together. Do you, do you take those rides where you get on and you go like to Star, Sturgis and take those long over the road trips? We've done, we've done a few. I typically don't have that kind of time in between. Uh, I travel about 230 or 40 days a year. Uh, when I'm home, I like to be home. We have an office. I have two sons. I handpicked their wives. They're all in the ministry with us. Um, and now we've switched roles. My oldest son is now my boss. And so I was home two days in June. It's his, it's his fault. So, <laughs> but we, we do, we, we've not been to Sturgis. Um, Sturgis has a certain, rep in fact, it's coming up. It has a certain reputation uh, as a huge yeah. out of control party thing, yeah. which is not our desire. I know there's bikers for Jesus. There's, there's, there's clubs for Christian Lots. bikers. Lots uh, of Kenneth them. Copeland's a big biker. Exactly. You know, so yeah. you can be, you can be sanctified. Well, I am in a, I am in a motorcycle club. Are you? We're the Hog Brothers, we're the Kosher Hog Brothers. <laughs> Uh, it's all pastors and ministry guys out of Texas. We get together and, and ride together. They call me the rabbi. That's my handle. So feel free to use that if you'd like. No. Uh, although I've never done the work to be a rabbi. So, uh, but we, we love it. My wife, she's praying on the back all the time. We'll put, you know, the kind of music that we love to hear on the bike. And and we meet lots of people. It's a great way to minister to people that you don't know. Well, I got to ask you, what kind of music do you like to hear? Uh, I'm, you know, ever since I got born again, 40, almost 40 years ago, I've been stuck in praise and worship. Um, I'm not a CCM contemporary Christian music guy. I just, I like music that provokes the presence of God. And, uh, it's the kind of music I write. It's the kind of stuff that I do uh, as we travel in over 70 nations now, six languages. Would you ever thought that? Uh, when you got out of school in Ohio uh, and got on the boat to go to Italy, uh, that you'd be where you are right now? You know, if someone had come to me at that point and said, you're going to be a Jesus guy, <laughs> you're going to leave opera and the temple and you're going to do praise and worship, for Christians all around the world, and your passion is going to be sharing the gospel with your own Jewish people. I, I, I'd have probably told him you need help. You know, go go find a good psychiatrist. You need to be taking some that kind was, of medication. What, that was in the seventies. I graduated in nineteen seventy-three. Yeah. I taught public school in Cleveland for two years, and then no, no, no. Before that, I headed off to Italy for a year. And then I came back, taught public school in a high school in a, in a pretty depressed area by a Ford foundry uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I had lots of students that came from broken homes, uh, addicted homes. And for some strange reason, it, I don't know why, but they were attracted to me. The, the worst of the worst, before every uh, semester, 
the principal would come into your classroom with a list of kids that were coming to your classes that you needed to check and keep an eye on because they were the troublemakers, they were the problem people. And uh, I usually got a list of them, a pretty good sized list, because they would come and take the music classes. I taught guitar. Oh. They came to my guitar classes. In the 70s. In the 70s, mm -hmm. yeah, in the early 70s. Yeah. They joined the choir, they wanted to be in special. Music was a, mm -hmm. was a real net for these kind of people. And the strange thing is that those guys, the guys in particular, not the girls, but the guys, when school was over, they'd come back to my class and they'd sit in a chair in front of my desk while I'm working on grading papers or whatever, and they just want to talk. And I've, I've run into two of these guys, some of the worst, since I've been born again. One of them came to a, a worship concert that I did somewhere I can't remember walked up behind me, this is like 20 years later, walked up behind me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, hi, Mr. Wilbur. Nobody calls me Mr. Wilbur. And when I turned around, sure enough, here's one of the guys, he's now born again, he plays guitar, he learned in my class, he's a worship leader. Really? Um, and he brought awesome. his son, that's also a believer, and plays in the part of the band. The other worst guy now runs a Christian music company. Wow. It's just it's just amazing. How to God me. works those things out. Before I was even born again, I was just trying to be a friend to these guys. Well, you must have had that love of God in you, though, because you were caring about them. You showed care for them. Mm -hmm. Let's take a little journey on time. I I love history. Mm. I like I like history. I don't know mm -hmm. something about it fascinates yeah. me. So mm -hmm. if, if you had the power for to go back in history any time, for one just for one day. You can't do anything. You're just observing what happened that day. Then you come back to real to the real time. What, what, when would you go back in time? Wow. Wow. I mean, you know, it would be so easy to say I'd go back to hear Jesus on the, the Mount of Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. Or I'd go back to the, the day of the resurrection, first fruits, whatever year that might have been. I might like to go see the signing of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I'm a history guy yeah, too. Yeah. I, I love it yeah. because it seems to be a document that so few people seem to care about anymore. Half of those men that signed that document were uh, lost their lives for the signing of it. Um, that, that would be really special. I, I might like to have heard Abraham Lincoln speak. Mm -hmm. um, now you already get one. Just one. You just get one. I guess I would have to take the, the first fruit. I'd, I'd love to have seen the risen Messiah. Come out of that tomb. Just be a part of the, the you know, he spoke to one, to two, to three, to, to 11 at a time, and then hundreds. Mm -hmm. Any of those groupings walked with him on the road to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. Any one of those mm -hmm. would have that would be a just pretty good thing. Just observe that. I'm with you. Be just to see Jesus day. in his glorified body pretty after he day. went to be the Father, that, that, that would be an awesome thing. Pretty you know, when, when people think about Paul Wilbur, what's the biggest surprise? When they get to know you, what's the biggest surprise that they find? Well, they expect uh, a guy that's passionate about music. They expect a guy that's passionate about Jesus, Yeshua. Um, probably one of the biggest surprises is my passion for motorcycling. They don't expect that. Um, they're surprised by our passion for helping the poor. We do a lot of uh, mercy motivated outreach stuff into the nations, Latin America, Zambia, where we'll take 50, 100 people, feed the poor, clothe the naked, um, minister with a group of 15, 20, 30 doctors and dentists. And, and uh, in Zambia, had the, the joy of leading the vice president to the Lord. Wow. He just had met us and something about the presence of God on our life, he got on his knees and received the Lord. Right there with, with people. This is the vice president. The vice oh, president awesome. of Zambia. So get up to Washington more often. <laughs> you know, we pray for Washington a lot. Oh, and we need to pray more as we go into this election cycle because we're, we're facing a pivotal time. This is pivotal time. This is a crossroad for our nation, absolutely. 
Now, when did you hear God's first, the first time you felt his call in your life that he had something special for you? Mm. You know, I can remember growing up and feeling like for, for some strange reason, um, and, and all of a sudden it just feels very emotional for me, but I, I can remember being a young boy saying, I know my life is going to count. Mm. That people will remember that I was here. Not that I'm, my name will be in lights or whatever, but I always felt that there was something important for me to do. Um, through my younger years and then in the temple, I, I got very discouraged about religious life. You know, I, I'm not trying to be critical about churches or pastors or rabbis or synagogues. It just, I, I never ran into the presence of God anywhere. Mm -hmm. The music at the temple was awesome. My, uh, my, the cantor of the temple was my voice teacher in school. We had a tremendous relationship. I know I've disappointed him uh, in the route that I took the gifting that he worked on so hard. Um, but that's, an, that's another story. But the whole, um, I guess it, it had to be the day in March of 1977 I had just heard a man give me his testimony. We were on a fishing trip in Bumpus Mills, Tennessee. Population, <laughs> 17. It was proudly written in pen on the sign as we drove into the, uh, on, into the city to go fishing. That night when we arrived, he gave me his testimony. He told me his testimony. And, uh, and it just it moved me. He told me of where he'd come from what he'd experienced growing up, what an idiot he had been, how he had blasphemed God, knew about God, but rejected all, walked away from him, and then found him to be the God of the universe, made a personal commitment to him, then went to Oral Roberts University and trained to be a ministry. And he shared all this with me. It so impressed me. I think for the first time, Don, I realized the God that I had rejected mm -hmm. but believed in, mm -hmm. I, I believed that he was, but I didn't like the way people expressed him, um, which is pretty prideful. Um, and I realized I can be forgiven. There is a way for me to know the God that I've always believed in but never met. Wow. So wow. the next morning before fishing, at about six o'clock in the morning, I got up. I went for a walk down by the river where we were going to launch out. And uh, everybody else was still asleep. I went for a walk. And the strangest, it, it was like I knew someone was walking with me. It got, mm. it got creepy mm. at first. It was like, you know, we're way out in the middle of nowhere. There might be some, some hillbilly behind the tree watching me, you know, at, whatever. It, it felt creepy at first, and then it felt peaceful. Mm. But it was so real. Um, I was watching as I walked to see the reeds bending by the river as I walked. I was watching them, expecting like the invisible man to show up. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me that this is God. I sat down on a sawed off tree trunk and prayed a very simple prayer. All by yourself? All by myself. I didn't know what to say. I just knew that this was my moment. I was experiencing the presence of God right here. And I said, Lord, uh, I've made a mess of my life. Uh, and, and I just give you my life. This, my life is yours. And, and without saying in Jesus' name, I, I didn't know that he's, his blood is the atonement that I needed on the altar. I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. I just said, Lord, I give you my life. And I knew that I knew that I was forgiven. Wow. I had a, I, I, won't, I won't tell you because I've never told anyone, mm. the, the, the bag of guilt and condemnation I carried around. I sang in nightclubs and bars and I was a, you know, seemed to be a pretty happy guy, mm -hmm. music, um, I, I had no problem with getting a date with, you know, the pretty girl in the room. 
I had a good job, duh, 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 but I was carrying around this bag that I could not get rid of. Mm. And the moment I said, Lord, I, I give you my life. I'm taking my hands off. I stood up from that simple little prayer. I knew I was forgiven. And somehow mm. I knew that Jesus was the answer. Did you feel that weight leave? Absolutely. I felt so light. I thought I was going to walk on the water. I knew I was forgiven. Mm. I, st I, it was like I stood up for the mm. first time in my life. Oh, that's good. That's good. It was amazing. God, God released you from the guilt and the, and the bondage that you had found yourself in. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what he does. Pray, praise God for his grace. Oh, man. And for his forgiveness. And, you know, if, if anybody didn't deserve it, it was me. Yeah. But somehow he just, revelation hit my heart. He opened my eyes. He opened my ears. The very next day, I started writing worship songs. The, the next day? The next day. They're at the campsite. I told my friends what I'd done. They were all spirit-filled Christians. and. And they did a little whoopy war dance, and you know, <laughs> that was really the. Per I didn't know, but that was why they invited me to come fishing. So, so you were set up. I was set up. Yeah. I was set up from my mother's womb. That's exactly right. I just didn't know it. That's exactly right. God had a plan for you before you were even conceived. Amen. Amen. I amen. I walked amen. into it. You know, when uh, you think about ministry and you think about all that God's shown you and done through you and done in you, and and you've seen so many results. What's the, what's the piece of that that you just look at and go, I just, it's hard to understand or hard to believe mm. that the Lord has taken it to this place. You're going to get me to cry again. Uh, just yesterday mm. in New Jersey, uh, we were at Jonathan Kahn's congregation. Mm. I know you've, you've had Jonathan. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's been a dear friend of mine for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Jewish believers just seem to find each other. It's a small flock, but growing, mm -hmm. which is a sign of Jesus' return. But we were there. He wasn't there. He was out ministering somewhere else. And, and we had a wonderful service. They gave me the whole thing. We did praise and worship. I shared a little bit and then threw out the net at the end of the service. Mm -hmm. And with so many fish got in there. I needed help to pull in the nets. People responded. Oh, yeah. So many people responded for salvation that said they were, they were tired of living the same way. They were tired of not being free. They were tired of being fearful. Mm -hmm. They were tired of not knowing God. Mm -hmm. They were tired of not knowing who they are. You know, the what in the world am I doing here question that every human being has. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing happened on Friday night. We were, we were with Jonathan on Friday night, threw out the net. That for me, if you'd told me that 40 years ago, you're going to be, uh, I, I call myself a musicianary, where uh, I'm, I'm a, the music is the bait. Uh, of course, for the believer, it's encouragement. The worship is helping them connect with God. But for the non-believer, it's, it's bait. And we're always throwing the bait out and, and reeling that thing in. And, and when the harvest comes in, I'm, I'm, there's just no room for people to stand. And I see that. <clears throat> All over the world. Why? Why is it? It's in, is it enhancing? Is this? Is, is it because we're in these end days? Yeah. Something. I, I really believe something has broken open that, but the the evil in the world is so evil, mm -hmm. that the promise of Scripture is that that righteousness will all the more abound, mm -hmm. and and the separation between dark and light, the the gap is growing wider and wider, and people. Are, are waking up to the fact that there is real evil in the world. There is a real devil. I'm, what do I do to escape the, the terror of this? And um, so, and the same thing happened Saturday night. We were in Pennsylvania. And two weeks ago, we were in the nation of Colombia in Spanish, four different cities. And, and the throw out the nets. And every service done, a third to a half of the people who paid a ticket price to come in and hear a concert with a band, right. got up out of their seats and came forward to receive Jesus. That's just the Holy Spirit. You know, there are people watching the program right now, Paul, that are in that category. They're hearing what you have to say. They've maybe never accepted Jesus or found Jesus to be their Messiah, 
or maybe they've come to a place and they've turned away from that call on their life. Mm -hmm. well, how would you encourage them? We've got two minutes left. How would you encourage them? Wow. You know, if you're watching this today and you're saying, Paul, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I don't know what to do about it. The, the world is raging today. The, the book of Romans tells us that if we'll just look around, all of creation declares and shows forth the glory of God. You can see him in the order of the universe. You see him uh, in the trees. You see him in a snowflake. There is a God who has brought uh, all the order to this world. And he loves you. He created you. And if all you will do is reach out. Listen, Psalm 84 says this. No good thing will I withhold from him who walks with me. He doesn't say, no good thing will I withhold from him who evangelizes the world. No good thing will I withhold from him who is the, the greatest musician of all time. He says, if you'll just walk with me, there's no good thing that I will withhold from you. If you will call on his name right now, he will hear you. He'll open your eyes. He'll open your ears. He'll teach you who you are. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 promises that. He says, all of you have received an anointing from the Lord, and all of you know the truth. You know the truth. You're watching this program, and you're saying, I know this is true. But like me, 40 years ago, what do I do about it? If you will simply do this, the Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Go ahead, say it. Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, can you believe that? then my Bible says you will be saved. You'll be a new creature. Your eyes will be open, your ears will be opened, and you will be born again, saved from the destruction of this life. And he'll take you out of a dark place into a light place and show you who you are. Amen, amen. And we want, to, want you to know that we're praying for you and we love you and that many have been called. Few can be chosen, but you can be chosen if you just listen to the Lord and obey Him. Listen for His call. You heard it today. You heard it through Paul. He just challenged your spirit, and in your spirit you heard it. So when you obey that calling, God will take you to places that you never thought you'd go. Amen? Amen. Forty years later? Here we are. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. God You're a blessing you. to us. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, too. Don't turn away from the Lord. Turn to Him. He has great things for you. You cannot believe what tomorrow is going to hold as you walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. He loves you. God bless you.